Okay, when we prepared for this interview, you told me that growing up you were a weird kid. <laughs> what did you mean by that? Well, I was a pretty weird kid. Um, I was one of those people who figured out that he was gay right from the get-go and kind of explored that as I was growing up. And grew up in California, here in Southern California, where it was an incredible environment for kids. That There was just a lot of us and had a lot of fun. But it, it was a time that I don't know that it'll ever happen again. But it was really exciting. How do you mean? Well, <clears throat> this is Los Angeles. We're constantly changing. So things that I look at and say, oh, I remember this, that's something different. Yeah. Sometimes really exciting things. But uh, especially in this community, there's been a lot of things, exciting things that happen. Well, how did you know you were gay as, such a, as a small child? That I was like playing with my next door neighbor in the bathroom for four hours. I kind of wondered what my mother thought we were doing, but didn't stop us from doing it. Uh huh. <laughs> So at what age were you doing this? Five. Wow, okay. And what do you remember from your childhood days here in Southern California that you no longer have? Um, one, that it was a lot easier to get around. Like just coming here today, it was like, you know, you have to deal with traffic that you didn't have to deal with. Yeah. Um, in some ways, it was that really idyllic childhood that people think of, that you played in the streets until the street lights came home, that um, we lived in a place where people had property and horses and, oh, wow. and okay. barns. I was very fond of barns. Why? Um, because there were a lot more room in the barn than there had been in the bathroom. Okay. <laughs> what else was in the barn that was so entertaining? Oh, for it was you? just one of those really, it was an incredibly erotic space. Are you kidding? It was like <laughs> just unbelievable. And when you kind of click on that and find the other people who do, it was really, really fun. So we knew the guys who were like, you know, playing football in the street, we were in the bar. Okay. Did you have any concept of like BDSM activity at that time? Um, I think I, I, people have asked me like, when did you know you were kinky? And I usually say when I was in the Boy Scouts, because I realized there were things we could do with rope and knots that were a lot more fun than, you know, pioneering projects. Okay. And it was, what was amazing was how there was this kind of like, just being kids, it was like, yeah, that seems like fun. So, you know, we tie somebody to a tree and strip them naked, and then you know they'd struggle out of it, and it'd be somebody else's turn. It was like, very weird. See, okay, Does that qualify as weird. Uh, okay, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but you said that. Um, rather, I'm starting over on that. Tell us about your coming out, because as a young man, you said that being naked with, with other boys was natural. Did your family have anything to say about this? Um, I don't know that my family ever figured it out. I know that um, when I was in the third grade, my mom and dad called me in and said, you know, how would you like to go to this military school? And I, I didn't know very much about it. I knew there was a kid down the, the street that went. And they were like, it's an all-boys school, and they wear uniforms. I was like, I'm in. Okay. That was, that was all it took. I was ready to go. Why that? Because it was hot. It was exciting. It was like, I'm going to be at an all-boys school getting to wear uniforms. How what could be better than that? Well, how did you have any concept of, of uniforms or anything if you were that young? That's an I, I don't know. I had seen uniforms, so I knew that they were kind of something that like looked great. Cool. It certainly looked a lot more interesting than other things that I'd seen, and so it was like that finding attraction. The idea that you cast your eye over all kinds of things and something grabs your attention and it has that erotic energy behind it. That even as a little kid, that if you're not necessarily associating it with sexuality, you get that there's something about that, that that grabs your interest. It's the difference between watching soap operas and watching the western and being like all turned on about the guys you know, riding horses and living out under the stars and then there's Miss Kitty at the Long Branch, and you're like, can we get through this part quick? Because you know, I want to get back to the guys out in the range. So it's that idea of what draws your attention. Well, that's very cognizant, though, of a very young boy to to be to even have a concept on some of them. You know, I'm not sure I completely had a concept. Like, I didn't get that this was something that wasn't an option. 
And it wasn't until later that people were like, yeah, you probably shouldn't do that. That it was like, oh, I get that you're trying to shame me about this, and I'm not sure quite how I feel about that. Which I was really, I tried to be the good kid, but there was a part of me that just wasn't buying it 100%. How did going to this military school shape this whole journey? <laughs> Well, I was the only one who thought that knee-high boots made the uniform look a lot better. Oh. And um, it was surrounded in this very, very homoerotic environment of just all these boys. Okay. And um, you were aware of things. You were aware of the kids that were like just a beat off. And if you were not a complete asshole about it, you kind of had like there was a gravitational pull. I remember one of my friends who, you know, had was this very sweet, very kind of effeminate fellow, um, confessed to me one night that under his wool um, dress uniform pants, he wore pantyhose because he couldn't stand the way that, that his legs itched. And I remember thinking, if he had told this to anybody else, he'd get the crap beat out of him. And thinking, wow. How did he know to trust you on this? I'm just an incredibly charming but weird child. Okay. Okay. I don't know. Any other experiences in this time? Did you explore more of your opportunities yeah. there? Yeah. For example. Yeah. Um, <laughs> what, it was weird because you know how kids go to school, they all go to the same grammar school, they live in a neighborhood. I went to a school where nobody lived in my neighborhood. So when I realized that somebody lived close, we would instantly kind of connect. Okay. And so those often became the guys that we wound up playing with. Okay. We weren't playing football. Did did you did you learn new things there? Things that you hadn't been trying in the bar? Um, you know, it's a. It, if I think about it, it's that kind of childhood exploration. Okay. It's like it starts with, oh, we're gonna look at each other, and then we're gonna touch each other, and then it's like, oh, but you know, we could do this, and eventually it's like. You know, I actually think I could stick my dick up your ass. And it's like, oh, let's give that a whirl. It was this very primal kind of exploratory experience that was just completely judgment free because we at least knew this isn't something we should be doing, you know, like out on the parade field. So when you did it, it was with people who were just kind of like very exploratory without that kind of judgment. So it was wonderful. Do, do you know if any of these other people have come out as gay? No, or? No. That's interesting. Because yeah. if somebody's getting fucked, you'd think that, that that's a little heavy for only just exploring. I'm not sure we were horribly successful at it. Oh, oh, it was okay. more of that kind of exploratory kind of thing. Oh. And it just seemed like that's the next thing we would try to do. Okay, fascinating. Mm -hmm. And I remember one time, um, we were out, it was late, so the, the, it was dark, it was nighttime, and um, and one of the guys I was with was like, I have to pee. <laughs> and the idea of peeing in front of somebody was like, oh, that seems really fun. And, <laughs> and it just led from, okay, we're all going to pee together, to we're going to pee on that, to it wasn't too long before it was like, all right, I'm peeing on you and you're peeing on me, and it was like, Okay. All right, that's cool. Wow, wow. Mm -hmm. I, I can't help but wonder at other institutions whether other people were doing the same kind of exploratory action. It's just fascinating. I, I really think that um, in, in the movie Six Feet, or the television show Six Feet Under, there's a scene where one of the characters is like, um, it's kind of a typical metrosexual, and somebody says something about you know his being gay, and he says, you know, I tried it, it wasn't for me. Oh, okay. And it was this completely non-judgmental kind of, I ate mashed potatoes and decided I didn't like them without any judgment. Okay. And I thought, you know, that was really very, it was a synopsis of what it had been like for me as a kid. Fascinating. Yeah. Let's take a step back, though. I, I want to come back to your very early kink, mm -hmm. because you said that you explored a little bit in the bar and you learned a few things from Boy Scouts. But bring us back to really what sparked that. Um, that's one that actually does get a little 
cloudier. Um, when I, I remember being in grammar school before I went to the military camp, and my entire life, I was always the biggest kid in my class. Okay. And without, after a couple of years, I would usually be the biggest kid in my school. Okay. So even though there were kids who were older, I was bigger than they were. And I had this friend who, you know, being a little kid, he, he was a bully. Okay. And he would grab these kids, and I remember, um, if you went to Disneyland, they had these, like, belts that had beading on them, like oh, yes. the frontier village kind of a thing, that I'm sure were all made in Indonesia or someplace, had no Native American <laughs> influence whatsoever. Right. But he would take his off and whip the tar out of somebody. Oh. And I remember after that, this idea was so anathema to me to be thought of as a bully that it really became hard. There was a, I can remember a moment when I had to really process that to be able to endorse my own sadism because okay. the idea of bullying had been associated with that. Okay. And so I was just, it was hard for me to see there was something else in there because that was so overpowering. But um, I remember being incredibly excited about it and then feeling like, yeah, but you're doing it to this person who doesn't want to. And so it was really conflictual for a long time. Oh, okay, okay. Do you feel that the that the instinct is that how can I say that that's indigenous to you is or it is innate? It, yeah, innate. You know. You know. I think people ask the wrong question, so they ask why. Yes. So somebody says, "I'm interested in this," or "I find that this thing turns me on," or. Um, you know, I'm really craving this daddy boy relationship. Yes. There must be something pathological about that. So then they do this why. Yeah. And it's like, well, you know, my dad wasn't the greatest dad, or I didn't have a dad. That must be the why. But we don't ask people questions like, why do you like chocolate ice cream more than vanilla? It just yes. is. Yes. Yes. And the problem that I see is that we impose all of these kind of judgments that goes with it. And then instead of being, this just is the way it is, it becomes pathologized. Yeah. And so, especially in mental health, there's yeah. this tendency to look at these very extreme examples and then assume that somebody who says, I, I like being flogged, that they must have some kind of pathology that's underlying it. And I think the most pernicious part of that is that there is this tendency, especially, especially among people who are very homophobic, to explain this away as some kind of pathology. Yeah. So yeah. you're gay because your dad was distant, your mom was overwhelming, and you just didn't play enough basketball. Yeah. I played the world's longest basketball game so that I could get in get a book world records. Well, tell us about that. 111 hours, 11 minutes, and 11 seconds. All right. We it, it was it, we did it when we were Boy Scouts, the older Boy Scouts. And I can tell you, it did not make me gay. It didn't cure it. It didn't go away. <laughs> I really enjoyed the showers and sleeping with people. It was fabulous. So. All righty yeah. then. Basketball was not a cure, despite what the reparative therapy. <laughs> but coming back to the Boy Scouts, because you've mm -hmm. mentioned that now several <laughs> yeah. times, that was a very... Uh, it, it taught you a, a lot of skills. Yeah. Tell us more about that. How did that prepare you for life? Um, if you look at Baden Powell's model, the guy who started the Boy Scouts, yes. if you look at it, it really is this leadership training experience. Um, he had fought in the Boer War, and they were overwhelmed. He fought the, the Siege of Mafeking, so they're completely outnumbered. And he has this kind of brilliant idea that, well, we're going to have to make kids responsible. Yeah. They're going to have to do the things that the adults can't do because they're busy defending us. So they delivered the mail and they did all these kinds of things. Okay. So the idea of taking kids and saying, look, you're 13, but we have to be able to depend on you. And so in the best programs, it's a leadership training experience. And when you okay. give the kids just a little bit of support and allow them to do their thing, they do incredible stuff. So as an adult, when I was involved in the Boy Scouts as a volunteer, it was like, that's the program that we want to have. And I was really fortunate that I had those kinds of leaders as a kid growing up. 
that could say, we want you guys to be in charge of this. Let's make this thing happen. What are your thoughts on um, the Boy Scouts' stance on homosexuality? I was the council commissioner for um, the Western Los Angeles part of uh, the Boy Scouts. And the three people who are in charge of that are the council commissioner, the council president, and the paid scout executive. And the council president called me to go to breakfast with him. And we were sitting at breakfast, and he says, you know that stuff that's coming out of Texas about gays and scouting? And I thought, OK, here we go. And he said, we're not going to do that. Wow. And um, the biggest problem with it is that the Mormon Church is the largest sponsor of Boy Scout units. They're so exquisitely homophobic that even people within this big national program were just like, we have to kowtow to them because that's where the checks are coming from. And so they had enormous power to do that. And in fact, um, when the Boy Scouts decided to be more forward-thinking about that, the Mormon Church basically pulled the plug and said, yeah, we're just going to do it part of it. And they also had the worst scouting program to pull. The Mormon Church? Yeah. Okay. But speaking of, you've you brought up the Mormon Church. You were part of the Mormon Church, the Mormon faith, yeah. at one point in your in your life. And you, you told me when we prepared for this interview that that greatly shaped you. <laughs> you think? And and I've got a list here of, of things <coughs> such as a stance on marriage, mm -hmm. politics, social issues, bearing testimony, <laughs> uh, the role of the bishop, lay ministers, doctrines, and there's an answer for everything. Yeah. I recall when we were preparing for this interview that we really had an in-depth conversation on all of this. Depict a little bit of that for us. What would you like your audience to know about you and the Mormon Church? Um, so, I grew up in a fairly a-religious family. They, they, they weren't just, it wasn't just benign, they didn't like it. Um, what do you mean? They, didn't, they weren't big on religion. Oh, they I had see. no interest whatsoever. Got it. And um, when I was 13, some of their friends invited them to some party thing, and it happened to be at a Mormon church. I knew nothing about this. I remember my father saying, well, I better have a cup of coffee now because I'm not going to get one all night. And I had no clue what he was talking <laughs> about. So we went. They had a Boy Scout troop. All these kids are playing around. They came over and like, why don't you join us? And I thought, OK. And then they said, well, why don't you join a Boy Scout troop? And, um, and my parents agreed. Okay. And, um, and I can remember the level of excitement that, you know, we went to J.C. Penney's and bought the scout uniform, and I had the scout handbook, and I was just reading it, couldn't wait to go to my first meeting. And I did, and I didn't realize that the Mormon church and this Boy Scout unit were connected in any way. It just didn't dawn on me that that's okay. the way things were. Okay. And um, my mom dropped me off. I walked in. No one was there. And I thought, here all by myself. I must have got the day wrong. And all of a sudden, the chapel doors opened and all these people come flooding in. And it was like, oh, I guess there's a thing that happens beforehand. And I didn't know anything about it. It was kind of overwhelming. And I, I remember experiencing this horrible social anxiety of all these people I didn't know and what's going on. And you know, I was there on the wrong day, all that stuff. And this guy came up to me and said, I'm your patrol leader. And he just, like, just took care of me, like, this is what you do now, and raise your hand, and do all this stuff. And then, when we started going camping, he was my tent man. Hmm. And so, um, he told me, we would stay up until 3 o'clock in the morning, and we were just talking about all these things. And one night he was telling me all about the church. And part of the Mormon mythology is that when you hear the truth, you'll have this burning in your bosom, <laughs> oh. um, which is an interesting okay. term for it. I mean, even though I had a bosom up until that point. Um, <laughs> But it's how you'll know that it's the truth. I had had the most incredible emotional experience. So I, when they came and told me that, I was like, yeah, I guess this must be true. I, you know, it all fits together. Um, it wasn't until quite a while longer that I realized, no, I had just fallen in love. With? With my patrol. Oh, I see. I see. And we stayed friends for a very long time. There was a chunk of time where we didn't um, see each other. And then 
had sex for the first time almost, almost two, perhaps three decades after we had been little kids. Really? Wow. Now, was the um, the growth of your your Mormon faith and your Boy Scout activities um, congruent with your time in the military school? Um, it overlapped part of it. In fact, that was one of the problems that I had. That I there was there were two groups of kids that the kids who stayed there overnight and the kids who went home every day. Oh, I see. And my mom had and dad had said, well, you know, your your last year, if you want, you can stay in the dorms. And I was so excited for that, but then I couldn't have gone to scout meetings. So I didn't do that. I, I didn't do the dorm thing. Because the scout meetings were so much fun. It was just so cool. But let's explore a little bit more about how the Mormon faith shaped you. Mm -hmm. Where do you see that in your current world? <laughs> OK, there's, this, there's, there's the, the face that said everything. Okay. Um, It's hard for people outside of that system to understand what it's like. Like people will say, you know, I grew up in the Catholic Church and this is what it was like. And they kind of assume that there's an overlap. And it's almost impossible for them to believe what a controlling, crazy cult this is. That's a very strong statement. It's an underestimate of what it really is like. It's, it's impossible to be too hyperbolic. Wow. Um, it controls every aspect of your life. And um, at the time that I was growing up, the historical part of this, you know, American church thing was just, this is the way it was, and you believed it because there wasn't any evidence to the contrary. Okay. With the advent of the internet, it's become really clear that all of that history is bullshit. And yet, here are these people who are totally committed to the story. And it's a, a very fascinating story. A 14-year-old kid is questioning, goes and prays, and, you know, God shows up. If a 14-year-old kid came to you and said, I was in the woods and I saw God, now we give them Haldol to make the hallucinations go away. <laughs> you don't give them 10% of your income and all your time. But that's what this is like. And so this incredibly powerful, monolithic organization um, when you're a young man, you get the priesthood when you're 12 and keep advancing in that priesthood. And part of that is a worthiness in you. So they ask you very specifically about, do you masturbate? Do you do these things? And when I was about 14, the bishop clocked it and was like, are you playing around with other boys? And I was like, yeah. He's like, yeah, don't do that. So I guess I must have been about 50. And it was like, okay. Because at that point, I was aware that if I didn't, all this stuff in my life was going to disappear. All the activities that I was doing, all the things, all my friends, every aspect of that would have just disappeared instantly. Wow. Because the, the level of homophobia is so unbelievably toxic that if you're that little gay kid growing up in that Mormon family, the idea of, yeah, I'm going to kill myself, that's the only option. Wow. Is not an exception. Wow. It really is the modal experience for most of those kids. Did you do a mission? Yes. Where did you go? Argentina. Okay. Yeah. Um, when I came back and I had left the church and everything, I would, people were asking me about it. And I remember being interviewed for by the Advocate magazine. And um, when I was a missionary, there was actually, because of all these visa things and stuff, there were times you just had to share a bed with your companion. And um, it was the most homoerotic experience that you could possibly imagine, with the caveat that you better not do anything. So here I am, this gay kid, laying in bed with my companion with a raging heart on. So I said, yeah, I was wore two pairs of gym shorts so that I, you know, pajamas so that I, you know, wouldn't get in trouble in any way. That was the only part of a four-hour interview that got published. It's the pull quote in the middle of the page saying, I slept in two pairs of gym shorts. That was the only thing out of four hours of talking to them. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. My gosh. So you had no exploration during that time in Argentina? Oh, my God. Okay. That, um, from the minute you 
step into that system, there are very clear messages that if you act on this at all, in any way, shape, or form, we will shame you in a way that is almost impossible to believe. So for example, if you were in your Mormon ward and you, you know, sucked your neighbor's dick, it's like, okay, well, we're going to deal with that here. As a missionary, anything that happens, they send you home in shame, and then in order to get back in the good graces of the church, you would have had to confess in front of the entire stake of all of like seven or eight wards, thousands of people, because technically you represent the state when you go to mission. Wow. And so wow. what you hear as a missionary are these stories of like, you know, oh, there were these two guys in Peru that were, you know, you know, fooling around and they got caught. And so those constant messages, these very warning, threatening messages that if you do anything about this, there will be a level of chaos and punishment that you can't even believe. Well, and this is uh, foist upon very young kids, too. Uh, the average missionary is, what, maybe 18, 19? When I was going, it was 19. They lowered the age to 18. Oh, okay. okay. It is an exercise in narcissism that's hard to believe. Yeah. To be 19 years old and telling, knocking door to door, selling Jesus, yeah. telling you, your life is all wrong, I have the truth and you don't, and you need to conform to all of this stuff. It's a horrifying experience when you think about it. But it, it, what it really does, the most important thing, it's, it's not a great way of bringing people to the church. Right. What it is, is a great way of inculcating the values in somebody who's suffering through two years of, you know, just abject boredom and yeah. stupidity yeah. so that for the rest of their life, they're wedded to the program. What was the best experience you had as a missionary? The companions that I fell in love with and never did anything about it. Oh my gosh. And yeah. the worst? Um, <clears throat> I didn't realize the worst until after I was gone. The kind of damage that I had done to people that... Um, our mission president called me in for an interview one time, and he said, you know, you were one of the most successful missionaries I've ever had. And at the time, I was all shoved up about it. It was years later that I thought, what I did to those people. What, I, what do you mean? What did you do? Did you take people and put them in this system that says, you know, <clears throat> all kinds of things, like every aspect of your life needs to change. but. A big part of it is that, you know, you're not good enough. You have to do all these things to be good enough. Um, that one of the fundamental concepts of their theology is that you lived before this life. Okay. And that in that life, um, in that pre-existence, you had to make decisions. And if you made the right decisions, then you were blessed for that and went into a nice little Mormon family. And if not, then you got kind of the second class. So you got a chance to find the church. And God forbid that you really fucked up, because then you were born black. Whoa, really? Yep. Now, as shocked as you are, I want you to imagine sitting in a room through 300 people who are all going, oh yeah, that's what it is. Wow. Yeah. I, 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 rarely am I at a loss for words, but I'm afraid you've done that. Got on my resume. Incredible. Yeah. How do they account for the other ethnic types of people? Um, not quite as bad as the black people, but on their way. As became white and white. I'm sorry. That their skin actually changed. If you found the truth, your skin would change and you would become white and delightsome. They edited that out. They never told anybody that they did it. But if you look at old versions of the Book of Mormon and newer versions, that's been changed. Part of what happened was um, there was a time that the the doctrine was no one with a single drop of black blood can ever hold the priesthood. Wow. And that was great until the church started expanding into Brazil. Yeah. Where it's like, who, what? Everybody's got some. And so conveniently, the prophet of the church had a conversation with God and they decided, eh, fuck it, let's change the rules. Incredible. Yep. Flabbergasting. I, I, I don't even know how to articulate another sentence after all that. 
at what point did you walk away from all of this? Um, when I left my mission, I was very compliant. I was like, you know, I did everything I was supposed to do. When I, um, when my mission president, when I was leaving, he said, I expect you to be married in six months. My God. So at 21, I was expected to be married in six my months. My gosh. I came home, it took me here. Um, I told my, my then fiance, I said, you do realize I'm attracted to men, right? And she goes, yeah, just don't do anything about it. Your trip to Palm Springs coincided with the breakup with your wife yeah. and the decision yeah. to divorce. The same day. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That night was a different kind of big bang. Okay. Which takes us to your turbo slut period. That was the turbo slut. Tell us about that. Um, it, if you work with horses and you keep them in a, in a small stable and then you let them out into a field, yeah. They run and gamble and do all the things that horses have not been able to do. When you take a gay guy who's been stuck in, yeah, I can't do any of that, it goes crazy. And, uh, and I've heard it so many times from people who, after they had this coming out experience, they just went nuts. And you make all the mistakes that you can possibly make. Such as? Well, if you'd made those same mistakes as children, it wouldn't have been quite so you know, problematic, because now you can drink alcohol, you have a credit card, and you can drive, so you can get into big problems, and you make really dumb decisions, because you're like, yeah, this is so much fun that I'm willing to fuck really stupid people, because, you know, I'm going to do it, and then it starts to settle down into what you really understand and makes sense to you, so that, um, hopefully you keep the best part of the slut part of it, okay. but, um, don't wind up doing the things that you're like, yeah, that's just not a good idea. That was, that was not a good idea. There's, there's One of the rules of life is that you should never fuck anybody crazier than you are. Yeah. And that's one that you're perfectly willing to, you know, ignore in that period. And it's hard to believe that, um, you know, mine was a transition out that allowed me to do a lot of thinking before I actually left. So I thought, I've, I've done with this, I've dealt with this. And I realized years later that there were still things that were so ingrained I yes. just did them automatically. Yes. So part of it was like, you know, you told me I couldn't do it, I'm going to do it every second that I get a chance to instead of, yeah, I'm doing it when I want to, not because this is my way of rebelling. But it took a while to kind of settle into it. Well, you even said you had to adjust your judgments and your yeah. your philosophies on, on life. Oh, yeah. What were some of the big ones that you had to do? Um, one of the ones that I think, especially in our community, is a hot issue right now, is the idea of, of like, monogamy. Um, for Mormons who are, you know, have a history of being polygamous, they're really invested in this kind of idea of, of monogamy. And um, I remember in one of my first relationships, who was with another Mormon guy, the idea of monogamy was like a really big issue in that relationship. Um, and it wasn't until, you know, a little while later that it was like, why do we think that's such an important idea? What is there that's important about this? And to realize neither of us are wired for that. Why would we be even thinking of doing that? Okay. And. Um, and these really weird things that are so prevalent in our heterosexist society. The idea of like, well, you and I are in a relationship, so we share a bank account. And I remember one of my gay friends saying, he was a banker, he said, I wouldn't do that with anyone. And I was horrified. I thought, you know, I guess his relationship isn't that important. And then it was like, no, he's a banker. He knows what the fuck he's talking about. And his relationship is fine. And I never had that feeling again, like, you know, well, the the symbol of your relationship is that you have a joint bank account. But all of those heterosexist kind of ideas and standards and values were inculcated in a situation that had absolutely no connection to that whatsoever. Was there anything about your discovery in the gay community or the leather community or whatever, was there anything shocking? Shocking. Surprising. Yeah, yeah. Hmm. Um, with the Boar Scouts and the Mormons are a great training kind of thing. By the time you're a little kid, you're standing in front of people speaking from the pulpit. Okay. You know how to do that. So you know how most people say that public speaking is this really terrifying thing for them? 
yeah, not for most Mormon kids. They've been doing it since they were little. Um, you know, how to organize something, how to plan an event, how to do the, all of that stuff is so natural. Yeah. Um, when I was 16, I was in charge of youth programs that it was my responsibility to create a committee of other kids and for us to make this thing happen and have adult leaders who were encouraging us to do this and training us how to do it. So it's a, a really powerful training program. And I remember one time saying, okay, they did that. They gave me all those skills and now I'm going to go use them, you know, in the place they would probably least like me to. Um, and sitting around <coughs> in meetings um, for organizations and thinking, why are these the people who are here? Because they're not very good at this. Oh. They're willing, but they don't know what they're doing. Huh. And okay. it took me a while to realize that we had lost an entire generation yeah. of the guys who had been the leaders and the creators and the founders, and they had died. Yes. And they hadn't replaced themselves. And so the people who kind of bubbled up to the top were the ones who were willing, but didn't necessarily have the skill set yeah. about how to do that. Okay. So I would sit in things and think, wow, this is really difficult. And I think it's one of the things that we still continue to struggle with. Yeah. That how do we prepare a younger generation to take on leadership roles yeah. and yeah. fundamental things about that leadership? Yeah. That it's about service and not about notoriety. It's about service to people that sometimes are kind of annoying and obnoxious and your willingness to say, yeah, but we're doing this because it's the right thing to do and it's for them. Yeah. And, um, and it's real easy to sit around and kind of congratulate ourselves about what a great job we're doing and not see the people who are falling by the wayside because we're not doing a good job of serving. And so I can remember thinking, you know, these are, these are big budget decisions being made by people who have never looked at a budget. Simple things like that. Wow. Taking a, a slight step back, you said that uh, joining the West Coast Singers, mm -hmm. which is the um, LGBT chorus of Los Angeles, mm -hmm. uh, proved very beneficial for you. How was that? Why is that? <laughs> um, a, another thing you learn to do when you're Mormon is to sing. Okay. okay. My vocal coach as um, a young adult was a guy who was in the Mormon Tabernacle Choir. Oh my gosh. Incredibly talented, lived next door and, you know, talked me into doing all this kind of stuff. So he was like, well, that looks like fun. And so um, I remember thinking the gay men's chorus is really cool. You know, they're big and they're powerful, but they don't have four parts. <laughs> so it was like, yeah, the sound of women's voices in a choir is just like so cool that I joined the West Coast Singers instead. And one of the other guys was, um, he was also a bass and we were both, he was, he's an inch shorter than I am. So we had to stand next to each other. An incredible musician. So I always said I sat, sang second bass. Whatever he did, I did second. And um, he was on the board of Christopher Street West. Oh, okay. And he said, would you come and help with Erotic City? And I was like, yeah, sure, what do you need? And I had volunteered and done other things before with Pride, but he was asking me to do this. So I remember going and looking at what they were doing, and I said, you know, Raymond, this is about as erotic as cream cheese. For the benefit of the audience, though, would you please explain what is Erotic City? Mm -hmm. Erotic City is the um, leather community's part of the big um, gay and lesbian celebration, the GLBT celebration here in Los Angeles. Okay. So it's the, it's the leather part of gay pride. Oh, okay. And um, back then, <laughs> it was... It was truly horrifying. Um, it, they had a tent and an area that was kind of carved off that was adult only because they hadn't dealt with that issue yet. And um, there was a sign outside of, of like a list of demonstrations. So 9 o'clock would be flogging and 10 o'clock would be bondage and 11 o'clock would be vaginal fisting and um, you know 1 o'clock would be wax play. And basically somebody would get up and be like, we're going to do bondage. And, 
you know, rope is used for bondage. Rope was invented by Seymour J. Rope in 1732, and then they'd give the comprehensive history of rope for 45 minutes in front of, it was just boring and awful <laughs> and horrendous. And it's what happened, it, a lot of them were the kind of people who the most they've ever said in public is welcome to Walmart, but you give them <laughs> a boom mic and suddenly they can't get off the stage. And it, you've heard the idea this was somebody who could fuck up a wet dream? It was like you could suck the erotic energy out of this by lecturing to people about it. <laughs> and so people would be doing something and it'd be like, no, I'm doing this. And I remember thinking, why is that what we're doing? Why, you know, we don't have like a fucking demo. So if this thing that I think of as incredibly erotic and phonic and, and like powerful is being reduced to something that's like an infomercial, there's something wrong about that. <laughs> so I did what I'd learned to do. I got the right people in the right room and said, we're not doing that shit anymore. This is our celebration. Yeah. We're going to do what we do when we celebrate. Okay. So if you were gonna come to this thing, what would you do? Well, I'd love to do flogging or spanking. Well then do it. So set up a space to do that and make it happen. And then, if you can behave yourself, you're invited, you're invited to join the party. So for somebody who says, I've never seen this before, what is this? Yeah. And there would be these people almost every year who would come on Saturday and just be mesmerized and then Sunday come back and be like, I saw this guy like getting flogged the other day. Could maybe I do that? <laughs> be like, well, sure. Why don't you try this out? So it was this really fun, powerful okay. kind of experience that grew and grew and grew until um, the leadership changes made big decisions about how they wanted to do Pride as a music festival. And said, Oh boy, we, we just have to separate because we can't go something that. But um, for a long time, it was, <laughs> I used to think, if everybody knew that this thing that we do, I learned how to do it courtesy of the Boy Scouts and the Mormon Church, ah. that would be the perfect kind of Absolutely. Synopsis. Absolutely it would. Yeah. But you said you're actually honored to be an elder in the community. How yeah. so? Yeah. Why so? Um, Carl Jung talks about archetypes, and so... As, as a union psychologist, I think about that a lot. And um, one of the archetypes that we lost were the elders. Yeah. So a whole generation yeah. that um, were the guys who had been there, who knew how to do it, who knew what the secrets were. And, um, you know, even in this very weekend, I've had this experience of the guy who was my predecessor in the role of being the guy in charge, um, the conversations that we had about, well, what about this? And then hearing the thought process of, well, you know, but if you do that, it changes this. And then there's this cascade. And then people without that eldering, getting really enthusiastic, but not being able to see, if you do that, this is the problem with that. Yeah. So you lost yeah. all of that experience. Yeah. The guys who knew how to do it and avoid problems and solve problems disappeared. And when they did, all of that information went with them. Yeah. And so I remember the first time, it was Mike Gurley, oh, yes. who uh, called me one time and said, you know, as an elder in the community, I was like, you know, Mike, fuck you. And then it was like, oh, wait a minute, I have to really think about that. And so um, it's an interesting role. And it's kind of like, um, what are their names, Waldorf and whatever, the guy, the Muppets who sit up in the oh, balcony yes, yes, and say yes, nasty yes. ass shit about everything that's yeah. going on. There's, there's a little bit of that. And I try really desperately to never do the, you know, when we did this, we, but there is this sense of we have done this before. And there's knowledge and experience that's really valuable in having done that before. Yeah. And, um, and the elder part of it is remembering, yeah, sometimes you gotta let people find out for themselves. You can't tell, they've gotta learn. So keep your damn mouth shut and wait until somebody asks you and yeah. be as supportive as you possibly can. And then yeah. when the shit hit the fan, try not to be standing in front of the fan. <laughs> well, we are here on behalf of um, the LA Leather Coalition. 
that has enabled the fireside chats to come here. What work did you do for <laughs> the LA Leather Coalition? Um, I was the chair of the coalition, and um, there's one of the bylaws is that you can only be the chair for two years. I th um, my predecessor, Will Hildreth, um, was leaving. He was moving, and he came to me and he said, "I, th you know, you should consider doing this. It's really fun and it's easy." Oh. Yeah. So a couple of years later, I was on stage and Will was in the audience, and I said, "The most important thing I can tell you is that Will Hildreth is a lying sack of shit." Because it's not fun and it's not easy, but I Excuse was kidding. Me. Um, it has been. It was an amazing experience. But I did it. He said it was for seven years. I don't think it was that. I thought it was five and six. Oh, okay. But um, it was a time of transition when um, when things were growing and things were changing, and we had to deal with lots of legal kinds of things. It was also an interesting time in the production of the LA Leather Contest. We had used the um, the El Rey Theater as our venue, and Wolfgang Puck bought the El Rey Theater, and um, was like, hey, all deals are off, they're all handshake agreements, so they're all off, and we had to find a venue and do all these things, oh. and so it was this intense period of problem solving, not the least of which was that Will put most of the expenses on his credit. Oh my gosh. And so um, the coalition jointly made a decision that you know, they would not change, make major changes to leadership until we paid it back. And, um, and we did that. But it was an incredibly powerful personal experience to work with the kind of guys who were committed to this kind of stuff at that level to make it happen. Fascinating. And that's the true nature of leadership. You actually produced uh, the LA Leather Competitions. Tell us about that. Is it is it of the same family as the rest of this? Um, things changed in the, the history of the coalition and the, the, the um, contest. Okay. Now they've re kind of reorganized how they do things because it works better now for them. Um, for us, it was the members of the coalition were also. The producer. So we asked somebody, "Would you be the, the head guy?" And they would come and present and do. So, um, in some ways, it was a lot more autocratic. Okay. But it was also a group of us who worked together in a way that's absolutely remarkable. Um, I, I remember one time um, there were a couple of groups who decided to join because they heard about us and wanted to be a part of it. We didn't have much connection with them that they wound up joining. And at one point, one of them asked, well, you're producing the contest, but you, he's asking you to judge his contest. But, uh, and I remember almost being like shocked that anybody would ask that. Because the producers meeting would be all of the producers, so the guys from each of the bars and the clubs and everything, would sit in a room and be like, OK, so what are we doing? Um, well, we know Sean always likes to do his contest first, so give him the first date. And what about this? Well, there's another event, so let's move this and change that. It was a level of collaboration and trust that was based on the fact that most of us were really intimately and sexually connected with each other. Okay. All right. So we played together. We trusted each other. If, if you're talking about what date do you want with somebody who you trusted to flog you, tie you up, you know, do whatever, it's a really different dynamic. Yes. The idea yes. that I will not do anything to hurt you because all these other people would be horrified. They, yes. They run me out of town. Yes. And so the idea of your contest is being attended by the producers of every other contest to support you was just it, it was just unsaid. It just happened. So when when you said here's this really great guy who's your title holder. It was, yeah, have him come over to my house. I'm producing a different contest, but I think I got boots that he can wear. And that kind of brotherhood, that kind of connection, get we, we laugh about it now because, you know, every guy that gets up says the word brotherhood at least nine times yes, in every speech he gives. But that's what we felt. And um, as the, the process has become more diverse, 
parts of that have changed. Okay. And the most, tr the most challenging thing is to try to keep the best parts of it and allow yourself to grow. And that's an incredibly difficult task for, for any organization. Yes. And, you know, our job as elders is to sit back and say, we never would have done it that way. Oh, yes. Which brings me to my next question, because today you, you've depicted yourself as the dowager chairman <laughs> of leather leadership. Now, what exactly does that mean? <laughs> I didn't say that, um, because there was a couple of other people in between. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Facebook does this really wonderful thing about, you know, your memory from five years ago, your memory from, Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, when it's this weekend, it's for years and years of the leather context that um, this is the 20th anniversary of the L.A. Leather. Oh. Uh, of Mr. L.A. Leather. Okay. I know every one of those 20 names on the back of the site. Wow. And some of them I'm incredibly <clears throat> close to. And um, what's fascinating to me is that if somebody asks me, well, who was, who was Mr. L.A. Leather after so-and-so? I can't remember all the time. And there were people in each of those classes that when I look at the group photo, it was like, well, we never saw that guy again. You know, that guy just wanted to be in a contest, and we never saw him again. And that guy, oh, he's he's running this part of it. Or he's involved in that part of it. He's, in, he's the president of this organization now. And so um, I know in the big scope, because I talk to those people too, the idea of, well, you know, it's just a beauty contest and it's, you know, pageant queens and some guy's brand new and people tell him, well, why don't you be in a contest? That's a good thing for you to do. Yeah. Uh, you know, his, he borrowed leather to do that. And I have a reaction that's very different than most people because um, my, especially my reaction to the borrowed leather thing, one of the guys who's truly a leatherman in every way had all of his stuff in the car and it was all stolen. He had gone to play, had everything, oh. all the stuff he was going to wear in the contest got stolen. Oh, how in awful. a week's time, we had everything that he needed. <clears throat> Just making phone calls. Yeah. You know, he lost, he, they stole his boots. What size does he wear? Well, that, I don't wear that, but I know somebody who does. Okay. And everybody took care of that. That's why. There have been guys who you're like, you know, if you said, tell us something about the community, they would have been like, I ain't got a fucking clue what I'm talking about. It was obvious but they stuck around and they had fun. And the connection among those men was so unbelievably powerful yeah. that um, it continues to this day. If you're doing bondage, there's a reason you blindfold people first so they can't see what you're doing. Um, <laughs> I, I had to learn to just be like okay with, well that didn't work. Okay. And, um, and to laugh about it. And to, to, you know, if you're covered in sweat and cum and you're not laughing, then you kind of missed something in there. If you're not, like, just glowing when it's all over, yeah. then, you know, watch Netflix. Ah! It's, um, <clears throat> but it takes a minute to kind of, you know, go from that, there's this image that I have in my head of what I'm supposed to be like. Yeah. And I'm not really good at that sometimes. And so I have to be able to just accept that, you know, I'm going to do it my way. And if it matches with your way, we're great. And if not, then we're still great. We're just probably not going to play it again. Okay. What's the biggest misconception about you? <laughs> oh. I'm, I would say... That I'm, you know, the, the perception is that you know I'm a toxic asshole, but that's actually accurate. Um, Why do you a, say a narcissistic that? asshole? Anyway. Um, And I have to own this, you know. 
if you're six foot eight and you show up anywhere, there's real advantages to that. Like you can tell everybody whose hair is, you know, proceeding because you can see it from the top. Um, I once asked my daughter who, if she wanted to go with me to Folsom, and she'd gone before, and we'd always have a, a great time. And um, I said, "Do you want to go?" And she goes, "No." And I said, "Something about it." She said, "You don't realize that for me, it's a sea of armpits." And it was like, "Oh my God, I've never actually thought about that. Uh -huh. That everybody else is all down here, yeah. and I'm seeing all this thing." Yeah. yeah. Um, and I don't think of that as intimidating. It doesn't intimidate me, so I don't understand. But I get that people can be intimidated. And I have to watch what I, the idea of resting bitch face. That, you know, if you're not doing something and you have this look on your face, people project, oh, he's like pissed off. And I've had people come up and be introduced, and they were like, I was kind of afraid to talk to you. I thought you were really scared. Oh, yeah. yeah. And so um, <clears throat> the idea that I was thinking about something or I was, you know, just who I was meant that I was scary. It was kind of hard for me to like, I'm not sure I wanted that. Um, there were times that I knew I wanted it and used it to my advantage. But um, I think that's the one. That okay. it's, it's like when somebody says, yeah, I, I was afraid to come up and talk to you. I was like, yeah, I don't know why. Because uh, <laughs> you're going to hurt your neck looking up, but that's, you know, that's what it is. Well, Steve Gunzel, thank you very much. It's been an amazing interview. Thanks to everyone here. And another beautiful day in Los Angeles.